There are two new CDs out now on White Centipede Noise, Incapacitance and Savage Gospel, and Size Effects, Richter, now available to order at whitecentipedenoise.com. Hello and welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel and today my guest is Jackson Abdul Salam of Commuter, Heracrat, and Junta Cadre. If you want to be sure this podcast exists into the future, be sure to support it on Patreon. That's the only way to get the full content of each new episode. Plus, there's a ton of other bonus content, merch, and community benefits to thank those who support what I do here. If you're watching the premiere of this episode live right now, there will be a chance for seven people to win a very limited commuter item through Patreon right after this episode ends. You've got to be a Maniac Circle supporter to be eligible, so be sure you're signed up at patreon.com slash white centipede noise before the end of this episode so you don't miss your chance. Hey Jackson, welcome to White Semi Noise Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Yeah, thank you, Oscar. Um, very happy to be here. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited about it. Cool. Very nice to meet you. Um, you have a new CD out with your project Commuter right now on, on, on New Forces that just came out, mm-hmm. um, which I want to talk to you about. But before we get to that, um, let's talk about your other projects, which are, I think, more active. And I, the, you know, the, the projects I more assume with your name and the, uh, that those are a uh, Heracrat and Junta Cadre. I think Heracrat is is the the one I most often assume with uh, associate with your name and and seems to be very prolific and and does more big album yeah. releases. Um, so could you maybe start talking about, with Heracrat? It's pretty interesting themes there. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, so Heracrat's been around the longest. Um, <clears throat> I've been recording under Heracrat been writing and recording since around 2011 or 12, I think. I started first getting into it. Um, so that one's been around the longest. It's just about to pass the 10-year mark of uh, having a release under that name. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of where I got my first break into noise, power electronics, um, everything like that. And then uh, it was pretty much just solely Heracrat up until, I think, the first commuter tape on Fusty and then the first uh, Junta tape came out around like 2017. Um, mm-hmm. So for years before that, it was just primarily Heracrat. Um, everything I was doing up until then was <clears throat> just under that name. So This episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Founder Mains. Founder Mains is proud to present the newest album from Himukult, A Third Fantasy. Five tracks of carnal industrial noise are presented on black virgin 150 gram vinyl inside a wide spine jacket and a double sided color insert showcasing new collages by the artist. This release has been mastered and cut by Josh Bonatti for optimal audio abuse. White Centipede Noise is an official European distributor for this title. Found Remains is a New York City label releasing crushing electronics on various formats since 2016. How has the project evolved from where it started to what it is now? Um, yeah, it's been, it's gone through a lot of changes. So at first, uh, it's around like 2011 or 12. Um, I was just, you know, first being like, all right, this might be something I could actually do. I had already been fan noise and power electronics and industrial stuff for a little while. Um, but I've never, I've never been a musician ever. I was never talented, skilled, had any know-how about playing any, uh, real instruments. So when I started listening to more noise and power electronics and stuff. Um, what really spoke to me was I, I always was like a very concept guy first. Um, so I finally found something like, all right, maybe I can, you know, use a concept, but I could also make a break into this cause it's not, it's not your traditional instruments. It's not, I don't know. You don't have to think traditionally or, or conform to any of that, um, to give it a shot. Yeah. So, around like 2012, I started giving it just my best effort. And at that time, my best effort was 
feedback loops and just chaining a couple of shitty pedals together. Um, <clears throat> so the first couple Heracrat things were strictly just kind of weird experimental noise and then even like approaching like wall noise at first. Mm -hmm. um, one of the very first tapes when I hadn't really found like a theme and I was in like <clears throat> very early 20s was uh, the Anna Karina tape, which I had just right. been listening to like too much of the Rita and, you know, stuff. And I was like, all right, maybe I could, <laughs> you know, I was like 21 or something. I yeah. was like, all right, I could, I could do this. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it was just like wall noise stuff, uh, before I had really found kind of the eventual mark, which was the primary topic of Islam, uh, my conversion to Islam, and then more just really, uh, vocal heavy, um, power electronics, which is kind of what Heracrat became around, I guess, 2014, it started kind of going that direction. Um, maybe even a little bit earlier with, uh, the, the first like really big breakout tape for Heracrat was um, I Bear Witness, which came out in 2014. <clears throat> That's kind of the one that a lot of people I think are familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, just kind of refining it more and more, going towards uh, overall like l more structured industrial power electronics yeah. away from kind of a free form one take harsh noise with vocals screamed over top to more... Um, you know, kind of actual planned out songs, uh, stuff like that into the power electronics direction, which is when, definitely where I have ended up with the project these days. Yeah. When you started, I mean, I know that first tape was thematically based, but you know, you mentioned you were kind of a concept guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you started Heracrat, was there a concept behind um, in the beginning? And, and what does the word mean? So concept for me was always taking things that my maybe life was focused on, my interests. When I, when I tend to get into something, I really throw myself fully into it. Um, so before kind of the eventual theme of Islam stuck, it was, uh, I was still interested in religion and spirituality. Um, back then, my late teen years and early 20 years, I was more interested in uh, kind of cultism, um, more mystic spirituality, things like that, which I'd been studying a lot. So I think that came into play definitely in like the really early stuff. Um, alleviation prayer was like the first actual Heracrat uh, physical release. And it was more about like um, esoteric and occult spirituality stuff I was into kind of, you know, when I was 19 or 20. <clears throat> um, and so as that started going in a more traditional direction of more traditional spirituality, as I started learning about Islam and focusing on that, um, that just was almost like necessary that it get pulled into my work because um, I don't know, it was such a big part of my life and I, it still is certainly, but my really formative years of my early twenties. Um, so I converted to Islam at 24 in 2014. Um, so I think, I don't know, for some reason, my finding my creative uh, path through my life in music went very hand in hand almost with my like spiritual life that I was developing in my early 20s, um, just because they were really formative years, both in me as like uh, kind of seeing myself as an artist and this is something I really want to do, as well as like my formative life that I found through religion and spirituality. This episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Absurd Exposition Label and Scream and Ride Distro. There are four new CDs now available on Absurd Exposition. Dodge Jones Rage, West Coast Power Outage 5, the power trio of Chris Dodge, Mason Jones, and William Rage return to AE with another dose of psychedelic circuit overload. Neural, H2T, an unreleased session from 2001 recorded by Howard Beilerman at the infamous Hotel to Tango Studios in Montreal. Fold, to favor the occurrence, Neural's harsh noise is formulated by the give and take of restraint and control. With his alter ego as Fold, Alan Bloor uses the same techniques to create ambient soundscapes rich with the tactility of their found metal sources. Rosalka, Base Waters, reissue of the 2019 LP. Using a theremin as a centerpiece, Kate Rissek leads us into a harsh noise odyssey of oceanic depths. Visit ScreamAndWrithe.com 
for all four CDs and a distro of over 2,200 items, servicing the international noise community at large. Can you tell me about your introduction and conversion to Islam? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, like I said, I was interested in cultism, you know, more in mystic spirituality. Uh, growing up, I was raised outside of religion completely. Um, I saw myself as a very staunch atheist growing up as a teenager. Uh, and then, you know, getting into crust punk and grindcore and metal, which is kind of where my uh, musical base interests were throughout mm -hmm. my teen years. Um, I definitely like identified as anti-religion and atheist and all that, that kind of usually goes along with black metal and grind and all that stuff. Right. Um, so I guess late teens, I started getting more interested in like just cult stuff, like reading a bunch of Aleister Crowley and kind of all the regular pathways that people find themselves in that <laughs> kind of in their, you know, late teens, early twenties. Sure. Um, so I started being really interested in that, um, both in kind of concept, but also, uh, I guess the ways that it, I don't know, felt artistic to me, mm -hmm. if that makes, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, so yeah, I've been interested in that. And then the longer I researched it and the older I got, um, I was kind of realizing that a lot of it was just kind of picked and pulled and pigeoned together from more established and, and longer historical and religious traditions, um, which kind of led me to uh, like Sufism, which is the more kind of like mystical side of Islam. Um, so aside from this, in my own life, I had a good friend who I was friends with throughout college. Um, he was studying uh, theology for his master's and he was raised Christian and um, converted to Islam, um, I guess in 2012 or 13, during, while he was doing his master's in theology. And um, it was like the first time I had heard of anyone converting to Islam. And, and at that point, it was still, it sounded really foreign. I was like, holy shit, Dave, like, converted to Islam. You know, it sounded it sounded weird and, and foreign and just kind of, a, I don't know, I'd never heard of anyone, especially not like a good friend of mine. Um, so we talked a lot about it. And he was living out in the Bay Area, going to school at Berkeley, doing his uh, master's in theology there. And, um, yeah, he was basically like, Hey man, uh, come out, visit me in Berkeley. Cause I was traveling back and forth to the Bay area a lot at this time. Um, he's like, you know, you can come to the mosque with me, check it out. Cause at this point I had already like heard of Sufism and he was going to a Sufi mosque. Um, I was like, yeah, that's, that sounds great. Um, so I went to the mosque with him and it was, uh, the first couple of times were really kind of life changing experiences. Um, and that, I don't know, it just really clicked with me. Um, I've always been a very structured person in my life. Um, I thrive off having kind of structure set up for myself. You know, I've been sober for a really long time, um, been vegan for a really long time. Um, so I've always just found that the best characteristics of myself are brought out through having come some kind of structure or guidelines kind of in mm -hmm. place in my life. And I started finding that as well as having like a kind of like a moral um, or ethical structure that kind of helped me thrive to be the person that I eventually, you know, saw myself wanting to be. Um, and I definitely found that through having more established spirituality as, rather than bouncing around through stuff like occultism and esoteric right. Crowley stuff. I found that something more established and uh, a little more history and, literature kind of worked for my life better. Um, so yeah, I started going to the mosque with him 2012 or 13, I guess, in California. Um, at this time, I just had that like real fervor of youth where I could just throw myself completely into something. So, you know, I was reading tons and tons of books, both written from inside of Islam, but also academic stuff written from an outside perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, just reading my way through like dozens of books a year, you know, about it. And then, yeah, going to the mosque more and meeting more Muslim people. And um, just kind of, it became a big part of my life, especially through those formative years, of kind of defining the person that I was. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned before, these were also the formative years of uh, writing music, um, 
experimenting with, you know, bringing concepts from my own life into my music. Um, so the two just kind of naturally blended together. Um, and it was kind of the main thing I was pulling from for those years as my uh, thematic focuses. What kind of a life change happened when you converted to Islam? Because I think anytime someone, I mean, in a kind of a, you know, young secular back from a young secular background converts to any sort of religion it's it's a big change and there are a lot of conflicts yeah. and, and things that need to be kind of sorted out and and, yeah. and sorted through and i think I, I guess just based on my limited knowledge mm-hmm. i think probably more so with islam i mean that seems like a very big mm-hmm. commitment what, sure. what was that like um so um yeah definitely like you mentioned there are some like uh, i guess restrictions that come with it um i stopped drinking not that I, I never drank much. Um, it was never really for me, but that was a big one. It was easy just to, you know, stop drinking. Um, so then a halal diet, I was already vegan for like 11 years or something. It was already pretty close to what I was eating. Um, the halal stuff mostly factors in with meat, which um, I didn't have to worry about too much gelatin, stuff like that. Um, so otherwise... Um, the structure of prayer was pretty new. Um, but one that I was pretty receptive of, like I said, uh, kind of benefiting from having structure in my life and kind of thriving from having something set up like that. Um, so benefiting from having like a structured time that I would pray, organize my thoughts, organize my spiritual thoughts, um, that would be a pretty big change. Um, what about in how you interact with the non-Muslim world or, or non-Muslim aspects of life? Mm -hmm. Um, so the, I mean, the kind of funny thing about it is, um, which has also kind of mirrored my life in, um, you know, noise and power electronics, which is kind of an outsider culture because I am, you know, like a heavily tattooed white guy, like I have always had to approach it from an outsider perspective. <clears throat> and a lot of the, a lot of the converts that I know I've met, you know, there, it kind of funny. It actually turns out there is somewhat of a population of us, people who came from maybe like a hardcore metal scene, tattooed vegan, uh, Muslim converts. I wound yeah. up finding probably four or five other guys who, yeah. Um, just, you know, through the internet and then meeting them and some of them are now my best friends. Um, my best friend, uh, Zach, he's one of my closest people to me. He lives in the Bay area as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think similar to finding a community through noise, I found a community maybe a, that was not your typical like Muslim people. Um, so yeah, like I said, I have definitely had to approach it from an outsider perspective. Um, you know, even when I go to the mosque today, I obviously look different from everyone else there and have come from a different background. Um, so I don't think it's the kind of thing that I can ever completely, you know, blend into or like, uh, you know, forget that in, in some ways I'll always be a bit of an outsider when when it comes to it. Um, so interacting with the non-Muslim world didn't change too much. I had to like more find ways that I could interact with the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was, you know, just kind of naturally finding other people who were like me, who I could maybe relate to a little more than, uh, you know, the 50 year old Iraqi guys at my mosque, which, (laughs) you know, I've hit it off with some of those guys too, but there will always be some kind of a cultural, um, wall there that it's hard. And, and, you know, mostly it is, you know, a middle-aged, um, Afghani, Iraqi guys. And a lot of them are really cool. And a lot of them are really happy to have me there and have a lot of questions about why I'm there and how I found myself there. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's more finding ways to interact with that world rather than finding ways to still interact with like a non-Muslim population, I guess. Sure. But in terms of like, like, religious restrictions. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I guess I don't, I don't know the various 
types of practice and, and, and yeah, but I mean, are, are there certain types of restrictions or things that, that you aren't supposed um, to do or that you had to stop doing or aren't, you know, had to change about your life in a, just in terms of re- religious sense, just to kind of follow your, not, not your a ton. Path. Um, a lot of that comes down to actually more of like, uh, cultural norms rather than religious rules of ways that we might typically think about, um, you know, traditional Muslim life. Um, there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot I had to change about my personal life. I wasn't living, you know, like a, uh, a sordid life <laughs> or anything where I really had to <laughs> suddenly cut out a bunch of like, uh, awful shit that I was, <laughs> that I was doing or anything like that. <clears throat> um, uh, I've always tried to live, I mean, um, you know, power electronics is kind of in, in some ways at odds with my life. I, I've always kind of lived as a, you know, a very stable, um, polite, well-mannered kind of guy. And, and that's also kind of like tying into power electronics. That's why it attracts me so much. And, um, it's a way to kind of break out of that when I need to be, um, so yeah, as far as restrictions or anything that I really had to change dramatically in my life, th- there wasn't a whole lot I would say that changed um, in my day to day life with how I was like really living. How do the themes of? I mean, you mentioned being attracted to the the kind of mm-hmm. um, I want to say rebellious, but but kind mm-hmm. of antisocial maybe or or. Ex- extremity, you know, extreme, extreme end of power electronics. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you then, how does that, how do you combine that with your personal path and your, your spirituality sure. or wh- how do those, how do those <clears throat> come together? Um, so the thing that I like most about power electronics, which I've always liked is it's kind of this open playing field for, uh, totally what anyone wants to say, what anyone wants to bring to the table, um, what they're passionate about, you know, what they, feel like it's necessary to get out there to the rest of the world. Um, and I think, you know, it gets pigeonholed in some different topics, I think, that are kind of uh, the traditional power electronics topics. Um, but I think, you know, there, there are a lot of artists that don't necessarily do just stuff about bondage and psychosexual shit, which I, I love a ton of that too. Um, but I think it's just kind of op- an open playing field for say whatever you want to say. Um, and so for me, I was, you know, like I said, I'm well-mannered kind of polite kind of guy, but, but when I need to, uh, you know, kind of unleash a little bit, there's nothing better than just screaming my head off to, to feedback about something I'm passionate about. Um, and for me, that's what power electronics is always about. I want to hear, you know, whatever, uh, someone has to say whatever they're passionate about. Um, I love hearing just the unfiltered uh, attitudes of people that they can just bring to the table in, in kind of a all all bets are off genre, I guess. Mm-hmm. Do you f- do you ever feel like with the project Heracrat or or just in general with Power Electronics, are you kind of is it a direct reflection of your personal? feelings, views, or are you mm-hmm. kind of stepping out into something, something more extreme? And do you ever, do you ever challenge, do you ever channel like the maybe more, uh, the darker sides of Islam into mm-hmm. ex- expression in, in Heracrat? Um, occasionally, but, but not typically, I would say mostly for Heracrat, Heracrat's my most personal project where Junta and Commuter are more about um, things going on around me, things I'm interested in on a more, uh, you know, Hunt would be a more kind of academic level um, with history and, and conflict history. Commuters, <clears throat> kind of more what's happening around me, what I'm seeing in my life, or, um, you know, we can talk more about that later, but but uh, Heracrat's always been the most personal, so I try to make it the most honest, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so for that 2014 tape, I bear witness. Um, it was all about what I was kind of experiencing and thinking about and going through with my conversion to Islam. Um, one of the tracks and it uses like the actual audio from me at the mosque, excuse me, me at the mosque converting. I think it's the last song on that tape is actually like 
the sample at the beginning is actually like me converting to Islam, mm -hmm. um, which was like a really important way to wrap up the tape because that tape was recorded over <clears throat> like a couple month period of like leading up to it and then kind of climax and finalized with that track. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> for me, yeah, Heracrat, I always try to pull very honestly and very sincerely from my own life. I, I try to not, um, I mean, there, there are ways like, um, the 2020 LP darkness over Najaf is a, it's kind of half about my own personal experience in, in religion, but half about, um, like the Iraqi war. And that one kind of sent me off in the direction of going towards making Junta, which is just more about conflict history. Um, so yeah, other interests do get pulled in, but I would say Heracrat is, I try to be as sincere and personal as I can in that project, I would say. Cool. Um, in terms of your relation to an audience or a scene, um, within noise or power electronics, have you experienced any conflict or, or mm -hmm. issues with other people or, or animosity or, mm -hmm. or f what kind of feedback have you had from people? Um, not, not too much. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be upset or surprised if I did. This is a, a genre where I would be surprised if everyone was like, very welcoming and i'm not looking for that in power electronics you know i'm not looking to be like accepted for different beliefs in power electronics i think it'd be silly <clears throat> um almost to be um you know like you know when it comes to this genre i'm, I'm looking to hear what people are passionate about and uh, need to get off their chest maybe so you know i would i would happily listen to like an extremely anti-islamic tape if it's good, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so when it comes to reactions, yeah, I, I've, I've never really had, I've never like got messages like, fuck you, you don't belong or something, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> not that it would like upset me or turn me away from it. Um, sure. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback. I've gotten people who want to know more about Islam, who are really interested in like, my path of how I ended up there or maybe their religious path either coming out of religion that they were raised in from childhood or maybe like me finding it later in their own life. Um, yeah. So I've had, I've had several people who are very interested in Islam reach out to me and that is probably the most like, uh, um, messages I've got from people I don't know at all who really want to talk about the project thematically, I would say most of them are um, from people who are interested um, mm -hmm. in what I'm doing and, and why it's different and, uh, and why I'm making power electronics about religion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so yeah, as far as thematic uh, responses, I've got just about the theme alone. It's mostly been good and mostly been people who are really curious and uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. Cool. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about Islam? It's, of course, huge. I mean, yeah, huge question, I think it's definitely in terms of um, your personal experience with it. I would say it's, it's culture versus religious teachings and, and practices. Um, when people think about Islam, they generally just think about the Middle East and the Middle East, you know, had a very established culture before Islam was even uh, on the table, you know. And um, just because of, you know, the tie-ins, I would say that we think of so strongly as what might be Islamic these days. Um, a lot of that is just Middle Eastern culture. Um, and, uh, and I say Middle Eastern culture, but I mean, things are vastly different from, you know, Iraq to Afghan Afghanistan and Lebanon. Um, there's no like one defined Middle sure. Eastern culture. But if I had to like paint a general picture, I would say it's, it's uh, you know, culture versus actual um, religious teachings. And I think that's probably maybe the most under misunderstood part. Um, just like these days in, uh, in the U.S., I think Christianity in, in the U.S. is viewed 
by kind of the loudest voice right now, which is often often the loudest voice in any religion or anything is going to be excessively negative. Um, mm-hmm. These days, it's really easy just to see the extremity, the extrem- extremity and kind of the worst viewpoints because they're or what's going to get attention, uh, yeah. what's going to get media coverage, you know, all that stuff. So I would say that's, that's honestly the biggest problem, not with just Islam, but with religion as a whole, I would say, yeah. and a lot of the misconceptions. Um, and I'm not, like I said, I was raised atheist and, you know, was pretty anti-religious for a lot of my life. So I'm not, I don't shy away from anything when it comes to that. Like, I'm very honest about it. So Sure. How does your family uh, feel about your conversion and your path? Um, mostly understanding, uh, I guess. Yeah. Um, my mom is super supportive. She doesn't really get it totally just with, you know, like noise and <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of, a lot of other stuff I've chosen in my life to, uh, really have be the foundations of my life, which, yeah, in my formative years were, uh, Islam and power electronics and, and noise and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty used to not necessarily having everyone in my life understand the reasons I'm doing things, but, um, I do have a really supportive and, and loving family, so I, you know, don't take it for granted. I feel very lucky, but um, not everything has to be necessarily understood, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Do you speak uh, or read or write Arabic? Um, so I can sound out all the alphabet. I can understand uh, basic words. I can't speak it um, mm-hmm. just because, you know, I don't have a lot of Arabic speaking people around me in my day-to-day life. And I think that's probably the best way to learn. Um, I can recite a decent amount of Quran. Um, decent, I say like kind of the the basic chapters that a lot of people know and learn. Mm-hmm. I can recite. Um, but yeah, I can't like, uh, I can't function um, like in conversational tone. And any Arabic mostly I'm familiar with is like, incredibly antiquated because of it comes from the Quran. Like no, no one speaks that Arabic right. these days, you know? So, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm sure we'll kind of touch back on that as we go along, but um, yeah. then tell me about um, Junta Cadre. Yeah. And that's, so, um, you know, I, tell me how that's, that's conceptually different. And also mm-hmm. if it's sonically, you know, what the sonic differences are there in terms of your approach. Sure. Um, yeah. So, kind of coming off of the that 2020 LP uh, Darkness Over Najaf a lot of that album like I said was it was half my personal religious life and then it was half um, about the war in Iraq so right around then I started really getting interested in learning about conflict history in the 20th century I was really fascinated by um you know, really captivated growing up, watching uh, the war in Iraq develop on the TV, you know, every night just watching the news with my parents or whatever. Um, And I think it really imprinted on me strongly um, just watching it. Like I said, you know, watching missiles hit and everything on on live TV, definitely (laughs) as as a kid growing up in that, definitely uh, shaped me in, in some way to really have an interest in conflict history and and how cultures clash and, and why we get into wars and conflict. Um, so yeah, I started really doing it a lot with that album. Uh, and then I started getting pulled into other directions like, uh, the Vietnam war, the cold war, um, you know, Cambodian genocide, just all these other big topics of the 20th century that I, realized maybe I wanted to know more about or were really kind of foundational in shaping the world, especially kind of the the Western world as we see it, maybe through an American lens here and how we view other cultures or countries in our, in our complex histories with them. Um, So yeah, so I started studying more about, I guess the Vietnam war first um, and then cold war history was really interesting to me. 
then that just led me down the path of um, just studying like the formation of countries, like the splitting up of Korea, um, stuff like that. And so, yeah. yeah. And like I said, I always kind of throw myself head first, really involved into what I'm learning. And that just comes out in my music. So at a certain point, I was spending <clears throat> so much time learning about that stuff that it naturally just made its way into my music. And at that point, like Heracrat is like about Islam, um, about my spiritual and religious kind of path. And it didn't fit the structure anymore of that. Um, and I'd, I'd wanted to do a project like this for quite some time. And I'd thought about it and conceptualized about what it would be about. Um, so I was just like, all right, now is the kind of the time that my interests are so focused on this that it only would make sense to kind of bring it into my music too. Mm -hmm. um, so that project started when I was researching uh, Chinese history, like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution in Chinese mm -hmm. history, reading a lot of books about it, watching a lot of documentaries and so forth. And so the first tape was The East is Red, just about the kind of general um, spread of communism throughout China and throughout Vietnam, Cambodia, and a lot of those countries. Um, so that's the first uh, time I really started focusing on that and away from Heracrat. And yeah, so it turned into, into Junta. So. Is it, are there specific things about like Chinese history and Soviet history mm -hmm. that interest you um, from a personal perspective? Um, so I'm certainly not a communist in my political beliefs, um, but I, I, I love anything that has a heavy focus on aesthetics and propaganda. Um, I love, you know, reading history of propaganda. I love propaganda art. It's just very powerful, um, aesthetically, I think. And, uh, I found that it's it's kind of I don't know something about the aesthetics of propaganda and, and power electronics really go hand in hand for me. Um, sure. I I like making music through Junta because it allows me to explore all the viewpoints of both sides um, of you know kind of coming from it from the Western world mm -hmm. where we have such a difference in opinion and, and viewpoint to the communism that was developing in that time. Mm -hmm. And I just love the kind of cultural clash that was happening. And I think it was just really ripe to pick from. And certainly I'm not the first person to do this. People have, you know, been doing this forever. Um, you know, Genocide Organ has made a, an entire career off doing it way better than I ever <laughs> will. So <laughs> I'm not gonna act like I'm the first person to ever think of this, but uh, something about sure. it, you know, within the genre just really goes along well. And, um, and yeah, what I like about the project the most is being able to position myself, you know, that East is red tape is like one side of it is like f really pushing a fervent message of, of communist beliefs. And then maybe the other half is, um, kind of showing the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. So I like getting deep enough into the theme where I can make music, um, not about my personal political beliefs at all. But um, just from the perspective of like a really staunch communist or a really, you know, anti-communist person. Um, and then just being able to explore kind of uh, both perspectives and, and flesh them out as full as I can. And, and sometimes as extreme as I can, too. Mm -hmm. How does your sonic approach with that product vary or, or how is it different from, mm -hmm. from Junta or from, from Heracrat? So I think um, with Junta... I started going more in the traditional kind of death industrial mixed with power electronics. Um, at first it was really leaving a lot of the noise out, mm -hmm. focusing on really synth heavy drones and, and loops and just really synth heavy approach, I would say, which I already started kind of dragging into Heracrat around that time, but <clears throat> flushing it out a lot more, I would say in Junta and pulling from more uh, kind of, classic um, European power electronics. Um, I would say my biggest influences are definitely for that project are uh, Genocide Organ, Survival Unit, mm -hmm. Operation Clean Sweep, 
Mm-hmm. Um, kind of that sound, I would say, where a lot of the harsh noise maybe doesn't necessarily come into play as much. Um, and then now these days, it's I did a tape unflinching patriotism on Fusty Mm -hmm. that kind of explores more of the American side of where American politics are right now. Mm -hmm. The extremity that was kind of found all throughout it. Um, And that started, the sound has started getting a little dirtier, um, more noise, more tape loop stuff, Mm -hmm. um, kind of getting away not necessarily away from a full synth approach, but kind of now bringing everything together as, as I get better at it, you know, mm-hmm. as a musician, now I can kind of combine uh, the noise that I'm getting better at all the time through the past 10 years of working on it, all the synth stuff I'm getting better at all the time, um, and kind of being able to really combine everything now into one full kind of more fleshed out package, I think. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So now tell me about Commuter. Mm-hmm. Your debut, well, sorry, not your debut, but um, your debut album, I think, a CD yeah. mm-hmm. on Phage Tapes came out in, was it 2020? Last, was it 2021? 2021, I think. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. Sure it was last year. Yeah. It came out in 2021. Um, and it's, a, it's great, and it's a very strong concept driven album. I, I assume, and I'm, I'm eager to hear more about that. And yeah. so, tell me about that first album, um, Inner SC Industrial, right? Um, yeah, Inner Inner Southeast Industrial. Southeast, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that album is kind of just, um, so the first, well, Commuter started, um, I guess, just mentally as a project. Um, I've been, you know, taking public transit for a long time. I, I don't this as much these days um, as I have my own car uh, now that I drive to work. But <clears throat> back in the day before I was taking, you know, the bus or the train every day for uh, six or seven years, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you're taking public transit that much every day, especially in kind of a, inner city of a metropolitan area you just you see everything of human human life (laughs) just kind of unfiltered and super unapologetic for whatever reason on public transit Mm -hmm. you know um i've seen like almost every horrific (laughs) thing you could think of on the bus you know people overdosing people fighting vomiting shitting pissing you know, just (laughs) really unfiltered uh, human life on the trains and buses of which city you live in? Portland, Portland. Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And we definitely have a pretty bad drug and and mental health crisis here, which certainly doesn't help it. Um, So a commuter was started, yeah, just of uh, kind of the almost like nihilism of just taking (laughs) public transport every day. And, And it evolved definitely into, into something else, but that's kind of like the idea that commuter was born from. Mm-hmm. Um, but the first tape was, I was in Japan and it's a lot, it's a lot different there. I was visiting Japan with my girlfriend, um, spent a lot of times on the trains there where it's, there's like the same intensity. Um, it's a little different. It's a little like cleaner from what I saw, but, um, I mean, people are packed in so tight this like very extremely claustrophobic experience Mm -hmm. in the trains and uh no one really speaks on the subway or the trains and and so all you hear is like the screeching droning train noises with like this claustrophobic body-to-body packed in experience um so i was doing a lot of field recordings while there of just riding the trains and um, I just wanted to use it for a tape. And, and the, the first tape was pushed out pretty quickly of just kind of this idea I had um, while there, but eventually kind of gave way to a much bigger, um, whole new kind of path I was exp- uh, trying out in noise, which is like field recording, very heavy sourced audio. Um, 
And then I wouldn't say like noise f- second, but definitely field mm-hmm. recording uh, the experiences. It's very important for me that commuter, like everything comes from my own field recorder. I'm not sampling anything else outside of just what I can find and sample in, in my day-to-day life. Um, so the second album, the first debut full length on Phage was kind of back to the, um, the, the roots of commuter of why I wanted to start the project. Just things I was seeing on my day-to-day life while on the bus or train experiencing just out there in the, <laughs> the crazy world of public transit. And then as I was writing it more, just kind of the city of Portland mm-hmm. and the kind of public health crisis that we're experiencing in, in general. Um, I had a practice space down kind of where all the, you know, I feel like metal musicians and noise musicians, we always get stuck in like the shitty industrial area of town when, mm-hmm. you know, it's the, the only cheap practice space you can find in town is often in like a weird shitty area of mm-hmm. town. And so we have this area here in Portland that's kind of just referred to as like the industrial Southeast district. Mm -hmm. And I was recording a lot there, practicing and recording a lot after work uh, in like my mid Mm -hmm. twenties. So I was taking the bus there and then having to walk like through that district to the practice space. Um, And something about it was just like always really captivating kind of the sites and um, just the people who were living there. We have kind of a pandemic of people living in tents and makeshift shelters here Mm -hmm. um, in the city. And I guess a lot of American cities these days, it's pretty common, but um, just seeing that every day while walking to the practice space, um, walking around uh, photographing kind of the, the mix of industrial architecture with kind of the scenes that were unfolding. Um, That that was another interest of mine, just like film photography. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was photographing it a lot through those years while I was just going back and forth to the practice space, um, recording haircut stuff and other other stuff. Um, And eventually I just had so much source of photographs that I had taken over those years that I wanted to also then start busting out my field recorder and and recording the sounds. And then after a couple of years, I had like just a huge bank of photos and sounds of, of this area that I was having to travel through all the time. And, and then in my head, like the next step was just making an album about it. You know, I had all the, all the field recordings of like two years saved up. I had all the Mm -hmm. photos of a couple of years saved up and then all the kind of experiences to go along with it, I guess, too. Um, and that is what turned into inner Southeast industrial. Um, just taking all those field recordings, all those experiences of, uh, you know, being followed by people having to weave your way through junkies and people experiencing <laughs> mental health crises and, uh, and yeah. And just kind of used all of that fuel to make sort of a, a nightmarish album about, um, what Portland is like right now, what it looks like, what it sounds like. Um, I just try to really be honest about kind of the, the sights and sounds and smells and experiences and, and Mm -hmm. make a harsh noise about it. How close are you getting to these situations? I mean, well, how much audio are you sourcing Mm -hmm. from actual humans? Mm -hmm. Um, a pretty, pretty good amount. Um, In this new album on New Forces, you hear like, uh, there's a sample that's just like a woman just like screaming like, no, no, get away from me. And she's not talking to anybody, but uh, I just happened to be like walking through that area and she's just like screaming it and howling it. And, um, you know, uh, I have my field recorder all the time (laughs) when I'm around there. So I'm just recording what's around me. So these people and, and sounds just naturally find their way into the music um so on that album yeah on any album anytime you hear a person arguing or talking or rambling it's it's taken from that area or the downtown area of portland um 
uh, it's taken directly from, you know, like I said, commuter is very important to me that I sample everything like location based and uh, myself, you know, I don't sample anything from like YouTube or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. So uh, yeah, every, so anything you hear on the album that comes from a human is like something I sampled myself. How do you feel when you're moving around in those areas and, and witnessing that stuff? Um, the easiest answer is I feel like making harsh noise <laughs> about it, you know? Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like interesting on like a, on like a level where I'm like, oh, this is cool. I want to be here sampling. Um, it's, you know, it, it's sad in, in ways it's over overwhelming. It's just like a, it's just like an exp a very visually stimulating and in, in a way, and also just audio stimulating in a way experience and, uh, yeah, it just makes me it just makes me feel like recording noise about it, <laughs> pretty much. Um, I don't necessarily find myself, you know, uh, like happy or sad or, or emotional about it. It's just um, it's just kind of is what it is, in in a way, and it's what I'm seeing and it's what I'm around and uh, yeah, I just want to make <laughs> want to make noise about it, pretty much. Have you ever been? like an active participant in any of the recordings or interactions or have you ever, um, you know, intervened in something that you've seen going on and stopped the recording? Um, let's see. I mean, there, there are times like when I've been on the bus, when I haven't had my field recorder <clears throat> and had to like, uh, I remember this was like before I had started recording the album, but, um, there was like a really young kid. He was probably like 17 or 18 and he was like very not, obviously like nodding off on drugs and he was sitting right next to me and I was like, there's no fucking way this kid's going to make his stop, you know? So I was having to like shake him awake and be like, Hey man, what's your stop? You know? And I asked him, he was like, Oh, it's the, you know, Hollywood transfer center. So I was like, all right. And, um, and then he was like, thank you. And he like reached out to shake my hand and like nodded off. So he like nodded off with like my hand in his. So I just like <laughs> held his hand to the Hollywood transfer center shook him awake and was like, Hey buddy, it's your stop. And he was like, thank you so much. You know, there was, there was no, he was going to ride to the end of the line if he had like just nodded mm -hmm. off. So, I mean, th there are like some ways that <clears throat> you can like be forced to interact with this stuff when it's happening around you. A lot of the time it's not like that. It's usually just like get out of the way. Um, you know, if, if someone's starting a fight on the bus and you just have to be like, well, I just got to get off the fucking bus <laughs> and get the next one. Yeah. Um, I'm like, I was sitting next to somebody and they got in an altercation and the guy was like, I'm going to fucking kill you. I'm going to go get my pistol. I'm going to come back. I'm going to fucking kill you. And I was just like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and find the next, <laughs> you know, get the next bus or whatever. Um, and then walking around, uh, downtown. Yeah. Usually, um, there's not a lot of like violence that happens that's directed like towards just somebody who's just walking through. Um, a lot of these people are just having personal, a personal crisis. Um, and it doesn't necessarily drag you into it. Um, so the closest otherwise I would have is like being followed by somebody. It was like pretty late at night while out there just, um, you know, recording my field recorder, taking photos. Um, and then that's just when you're like, all right, it's probably time to, time to get out of here. Yeah. Um, do you have any personal things in your life that connect mm -hmm. you to a fascination with this element of humanity? Um, I wouldn't say personally, otherwise just being forced to spend a lot of time uh, around it, you know, on the bus, walking through these areas, just seeing it day to day in my life, I guess the way that it kind of, uh, you're just forced to be around it um, out of necessity sometimes, you know, like I said, like commuting to work just out of necessity 
you're just like kind of dragged into that world sometimes. So I would say that's that's about as personal as it gets. Um, as far as yeah, feeling a connection with those things. Otherwise, uh, not having like a super super deep connection with it on a personal level, like uh, I don't know. Uh, otherwise, how does your religion affect the way you relate to this these topics? That's a good question. Um, Islam has a pretty emphasis on doing the best you can to help out with people who are in a destitute um, or tragic situation. Uh, a heavy emphasis on volunteer work, charity, um, things of that nature. So, and then in ways it also uh, maybe makes me battle with faith a little bit in certain ways, seeing maybe the worst of, of people and seeing really destitute situations, I think <clears throat> in almost way is a healthy way to call into my teachings of faith. You know, why are, why are things like this and why are they, you know, is it necessary to have this kind of thing happen in the world? Um, so I think it's almost like a balancing act, you know, between kind of the, the, the joyous expressions sometimes that I'm putting forth and, and finding in Heracrat albums to kind of this extreme almost negativity in some ways that I'm exploring through Commuter, I think is, is almost just like this kind of necessary balance of of what is the world actually like, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the world's never going to actually just be like the teachings of religion or, or function like that. Um, there's always going to be a more like real world or more reality based world happening around me too. Um, so I've done a lot of like volunteer work in my life with, I used to volunteer at this place called Urco. It was a imminent uh, immigrant and refugee community organization which helps people, you know, uh, immigrating from places in Africa or, or Middle East that um, kind of helps them break down, you know, the systems here of getting uh, help through welfare or government programs can be incredibly convoluted and, and confusing to people who are coming mm -hmm. from other places that maybe they don't have these systems set up or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe language barrier is extremely confusing and getting placed into these um systems for helping people coming over here in their situation. Um, so that was uh, really rewarding work to do with uh, those communities. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of a, like I said, it's a balance between what faith teaches and, and what is possible in faith and, and what is the actual reality of our world like today. And I think it's, mm -hmm kind of necessary, especially for someone to, who subscribes to uh, spiritual beliefs to kind of see the full picture and not put my blinders up to things that are happening around me mm -hmm. in ways. Yeah. What does the title of the new album mean? No longer penitent. Um, so like making penance or wanting to make penance, um, you know, it, it kind of, it kind of draws up like a spiritual imagery into it, um, where like, uh, kind of, like I said, like the battle of, of living in a spiritual life, but then also seeing things like this day to day <clears throat> and, and how maybe we are desensitized to seeing shit like this, you know, maybe if I see, you know, seeing someone overdose on the bus or at a bus stop, maybe after your first couple times <laughs> at a certain point, you're just like, Oh, that, that person's fucked up, you know? And, and it kind of the way seeing stuff like this kind of um, starts to chisel away or maybe erode your humanity in, in ways where, especially for someone like me who 
subscribes to and believes in like teachings of faith, how can I, how can I work that into the realities of, of what I'm living around, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just basically about that maybe being, uh, desensitized to some of the shit that I've been seeing. Um, you know, Portland, I hear Seattle is really bad right now, but we, I mean, seriously have like a crisis of, there's like tent encampments everywhere. Uh, you know, if I'm like wheeling my garbage out to the curb barefoot, you know, I can't anymore. Cause I've, you know, found like needles and syringes and shit, like even, you know, that close to my house. Um, so ways that, yeah, ways that we become desensitized, uh, mm -hmm. to, to things like this. And, and maybe it is just nor a part of my normal day seeing people, you know, sleeping at bus stops and, and maybe not even occurring to me like, Oh, is that person responsive? You know? So that's, yeah, no longer penitent is just kind of calls into that, um, that desensitized, uh, way that we can go about our day-to-day -day life while seeing stuff like this. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the future for, um, well, well, how, well, how does this project differ? How does this mm -hmm. album differ than the, than the first album in terms of, are you using the same source that you called over the same kind of period of time? Mm -hmm. Have you, have you, have you, have you changed your approach or changed your, your goals with it in some so way? I think the biggest change in my approach was bringing in a lot of, um, like tape elements this time, learning more about, uh, tape loops and tape degradation and, uh, just finding like more interests in cassette music and tape, excuse me, tape music. Um, something that I haven't really experimented with very much before in Heracrat or Huntikata or anything like that. Um, and the uh, first time I brought tape stuff into play, I think was on that unflinching patriotism tape. Um, and yeah, just getting more interested in that approach. So as far as like gear wise, there's a lot more tape elements on this one. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to make tape loops and just uh, like dubbing a bunch of field recordings on a tape and then manipulating it that way. So as far as sound wise, there's definitely, there's more of that. I would say it's the biggest difference. Um, thematic approach, I totally scrapped every field recording I had from previous sep uh, sessions and I started, I totally started over new. I didn't, I didn't want anything from past sessions making it into this album. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I saw it as like a, a brand new, brand new slate. So I wanted to totally start fresh. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the first step of making these albums. And, um, and my, my approach to noise now, I guess, versus like those early kind of Heracrat tapes, uh, when I was just sitting down and banging it out in like one session, one take mm -hmm. improvised. Um, these are, especially this past commuter album, I think it's, it's probably the hardest I've ever worked on any music ever, you know? Um, and when I'm <clears throat> really into it, I'm, you know, I can easily do like an eight to 10 hour day without mm -hmm. any breaking up my day when I'm like really in the zone. <clears throat> Cause there's, mm -hmm so many different stages like that this goes through first mm -hmm. is just collecting um, hours of like source recordings, whether that's walking around riding the bus with field recorder in hand and, and trying to get as much like on location sound as I can, um, which could be just as simple as like the sound of my feet, walking through gravel or on the streets or uh, like kicking garbage out of my way as I'm walking in some of these areas to like uh, finding trash on the sidewalks that I'm kicking around, mm -hmm. fi finding weird discarded metal or plastic or wood that I'm kicking out of my way or collecting to bring home with mm -hmm. me to like do more uh, like session, uh, sorry, session field recording. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, first just collecting like shitload of just uh, source audio. Um, that's kind of like the first step, and then second step is often just going around with either a film camera or just my phone camera and like um, 
just taking photos of what I'm seeing. So like mm -hmm. every photo on the phage tape and now the new forces tape has been like on location um, mm -hmm. from those nights of walking around with my field recorder or, or days walking around with my field recorder. Cause I feel like it's, I really want to bring the full package of, mm -hmm. um, you know, sights, sounds, experiences. I, I want to be able to, as much as I can, like draw the listener and viewer in through like the full package of, of feeling like they're there walking along with me, you know, mm -hmm. at midnight through these areas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, so yeah, so then I have my audio, I got my visuals and then it's time to like, uh, either a collect, um, uh, like studio field recordings, which I fortunately have like a nice big shed out in my backyard where mm -hmm. I can just go and, you know, I have like a nice big steel drum back there. Mm -hmm. I can, uh, I'll sit for like hours on Craigslist, uh, going through like ads of free, you know, junk that people are throwing mm -hmm. away. Um, mm -hmm. I have a pickup truck so I can just like go and pick up shit that people are getting rid of filing cabinets. Nice. Yep. Um, piles of wood, um, anything that I feel like I could mash around to make interesting mm -hmm. noises. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so those are kind of the more uh, traditional uh, sound sources of junk metal. And then, and then I'll spend days just at home of what can I use to make an interesting sound. Um, turning up my field recorder to really sensitive volumes and letting water run down my drain. What, you know, what is mm -hmm. that going to sound like? Mm -hmm. um, filling up, uh, you know, like a big metal water bottle and, and lightly tapping it at like a really amplified volume. Oh, what is that mm -hmm. going to sound like? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, putting my field recorder two rooms over and then banging on a wall, you know, oh, mm -hmm. what, what is that going to sound like? So just trying, trying everything I can for hours in my house of maybe when it's a rainy day that I can't actually be out, uh, recording out, you know, outside in, in these areas, how else can I just make weird, uh, noises, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of that, you know, I draw on, uh, being kind of friends and, collaborators with people like um jason krumer um mm -hmm. you know other people who are just have these really kind of a like cinematic almost mm -hmm. uh, approaches to making noise um yeah just how can i make weird sounds you know and, yeah. and like what can i do to push uh the envelope of of source audio mm -hmm. and that might not always come through in the recording themselves because at times they do tend to get so harsh that maybe some of that is lost but sure. for me it's uh i don't know a way to dig in deep and just feel connected and and try to work as hard as i can on these things mm -hmm. so cool um when you put them together as a final piece are you are you doing much like multi-tracking and, and editing or are they kind of like live takes once you've gotten all the pieces in place or how do you do that? Yeah. Um, so usually I, for this one, I did a lot of taking my samples from my field recorder, dubbing it to tapes and then working that way um, through different tape decks um, and doing kind of just live long sessions like that. Mm -hmm. So, so it'll be definitely part, live long just one big solid blocks of harsh noise seg <clears throat> excuse me segments mm -hmm. um and then going in and very meticulously um layering uh almost to like a ocd or like really maddening um mm -hmm. pinpoint making sure like every every sound on these tapes every start and stop and, and transition and switch is like really, really labored over in a way that mm -hmm. I used to just let the noise just like rip for itself sometimes. And, and there are long periods of several minutes of just, you know, one big block of, of live mm -hmm. session, uh, just like ripping harsh noise. And then what makes it commuter these days is taking that 
and then combining it with like very, very meticulous planned, um, composed, uh, bits and pieces of field recordings, atmospheric segments, Mm -hmm. um, just sometimes like the raw sound of the materials, like the wood and, and metal itself coming through and then like layering that with just like the big fat segments of like walloping noise, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's something, like I said, I think I've, I've worked harder on this commuter album and, and the previous one than like, uh, like I find it a lot harder to make better noise mm -hmm. or good noise rather than like making like good power electronics. Um, mm -hmm. I find is like, like infinitely harder. Maybe I'm like, more naturally akin to the power electronics and industrial shit. But like, I find it so hard to like make stuff that like captivates me as a listener. You know, I want to be, I want to make sure my own attention is held by the stuff I'm making. And I find that like much harder when it comes to harsh noise to make like good, sincere and like also intention uh, holding yeah. noise. Yeah. You know? That's, that's cool that you, that you do that. And you said that because mm. I mean, I think in some way, Power electronics has more, has I think a wider appeal maybe. Yeah, because it's a bit more musical. It's a bit more like you know, it's kind of more connected to industrial music, and so I think people have the kind of the impression that power electronics is inherently more com compositional and more labor intensive and more yeah. skilled, I guess, mm -hmm. than harsh noise. But I think it's interesting. That um, I mean, I, I, I can understand mm -hmm. that for sure. I mean, I can relate to that, but I think it's interesting yeah. that you say that, that making these albums that, you know, they're, I mean, they're very well received. I mean, I love them, but I mean, they're maybe more less accessible than maybe yeah. your work with Heracrat mm -hmm. for a wider, you know, for a wider industrial audience, but yeah, you're it putting might be so much work into them and, 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 and really laboring over them intensely mm -hmm. is, I think a good yeah a respectful I, thing i think um part of it is definitely like uh because of the approach of like i'm spending so much time you could say like in the field you know before it even comes to like making yeah. the noise like gathering the uh gathering the sound sources the visuals and then like even gathering the experiences is kind of taxing like over the years yeah um <clears throat> like all the the track titles aren't like they're not just like things i'm making up it's like all based on um like i, I write it down you know if i've seen something um yeah. there there are like a lot of uh there's one track on this new album that's like you hear a lighter sparking over and mm -hmm. over and it's like this guy like i was at this um it's called the the max here it's like our rail system <clears throat> i was at mm -hmm. this max stop downtown and he's like he's like really fucked up and he was like trembling and he was like trying to free base um, I guess it was like crack. Uh, I couldn't tell what it was, but like he, his lighter wasn't working and he's like almost like in a trance, like just flicking the lighter, trying to like mm -hmm. smoke this. And I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> just like, yeah. like <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, you know? Yeah. Um, like, uh, you, so you, you mentioned like that, getting, that. Sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Go like ahead. Getting, sorry. getting the track titles is like taxing <laughs> in a yeah. way, you know? For sure. And you mentioned kind of that, you know, you don't really feel strong, super strong emotions when you're, when you're dealing with this stuff. But does the, I mean, I imagine it is quite taxing and, and harrowing in some way. Does that feeling or does that experience carry over through the process of, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you're going and collecting the source and you're collecting the images and then you're working with that source for a long time. And I mean, yeah. it's not just like sounds of, of, a, of a bus or something like that. It's like sounds of, mm -hmm. you know, human distress yeah. and human voices. Does that, how, does that carry over into the process and how to, definitely how is that? Um, it's a lot different than recording, you know, Junta, Junta Cotter is like a, just very like analytical from like a maybe academic perspective. Um, and I, I'm almost like kind of playing roles in that I'm, I'm playing the role of someone who's uh, staunchly, you know, communist or anti-communist. I'm really trying to get into their head and, you know, scream my head off about a perspective that might not be my own. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Heracrats really almost like um, like celebratory, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, really intensely passionate. And um, yeah, ce- celebratory could be a good word. Mm-hmm. Um, where I'm like really screaming my head off about something that's like personal and, and brings joy to my life. And also like, I mean, spirituality is certainly a, a struggle too, but it, it's one that's like worth it ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, but then commuter, yeah, it's definitely, it's puts me in a way different headspace where, like I said, it, it might not be personal like Heracrat and it's not kind of academic. I'm not, I'm not trying to present it from the perspective of the places that I'm sourcing my audio and the people that might be sourced in the audio just because of where I am. But um, it comes from less personal me, but something that is around me. Uh, So it's definitely, it's, it's the darkest for sure out of any of my projects um, Mm -hmm. just because of the material that it is. And, and uh, mentally it definitely puts me in uh, the darkest place, I think too. And, Mm -hmm. and like I said, I, these, these albums, I work, I mean, really hard for months and any, you know, I work, I, I usually can get in between two to four hours of work on it on days that I'm not going to my normal job. Mm-hmm. And then days that I'm off, I can do usually two days back to back of like eight to 10 hours. Um, mm-hmm. And so like when I'm in it, I'm like, I'm like really, really, really deep into it. Um, mm-hmm. Looking at the photos, listening to the raw material, writing the titles. So yeah, it can be really all consuming in like a, in a not, uh, not enjoyable way for sure. Mm-hmm. And and I think, and I think that can definitely come out in the noise just as much as like, um, I want to drag people into, uh, the experience of, of being there through the, the imagery and, and the sounds. I want to drag people into the atmosphere of, of what it might, you know, be like being, being in these places themselves. I think mm-hmm. it's a pretty important part of the music that it is, uh, really dark and that people approach it, approach it with a seriousness that that it deserves, I, th- I think. Not that the music deserves, but that these circumstances and, and these atmospheres deserve to be treated with, you know? Mm-hmm. In a way, it, it is definitely um, exploiting it, I think. And I think it's okay if people accuse me of that. Um, it is using it to make an album, but um, at the same time, it's it's harsh noise, you know, I <laughs> get used sure. to listening to something Why? maybe that is, uh, maybe a, a harsh reality, <laughs> um, yeah. or, or has the potential to be exploited in a way, you know? Yeah. What do you get out of it in the end? Um, I get out of it, a, a record of, uh, like I said, going through these places every day or living around this or, or walking through it every day is yeah. For a commuter, it's, it's just a, it's just a record of these things that I'm seeing, but also like the, the state that the city is in. Um, it's very, I try to make it, I try to, I also try not to over emphasize or like over hyper or paint these things in like uh, too much of spectacular colors, you know? Mm-hmm. I just want to present it for what it is. Um, and, and in that way you could say maybe it isn't necessarily exploiting the material. I, I'm just trying to present it very, uh, almost logically, you know, mm-hmm. um, I just, I just want to show what it's like being around these things. And mm-hmm. so for me, I get out of it just, uh, yeah, just like an archival record essentially of what it would be like to take all these things and what it might sound like as a noise album, you know? Yeah. So you have your new album is out now Mm -hmm. on new forces. Yep. No longer penitent. Mm -hmm. What else uh, is in the pipeline that you want to tell us about? So also that should hopefully be out around the time that this um, episode drops right around the time of the um, full length 
Sam, who I talked a lot about earlier, uh, has started his own kind of um, label and show promotion um, uh, thing called World Asylum. So mm -hmm. he is doing yeah. the first batch of World Asylum tapes. It should hopefully be out right around the same time as this episode in, in the full length comes out. Um, I recorded right around that time that Summer Scum was happening. I recorded a CDR of commuter stuff. It's very, it's not, it doesn't lean into field recording stuff. It doesn't lean into atmospheric passages. It's just straight, like 30 minutes of just absolute crushing as good as I can make just straight harsh noise. It's like mm -hmm. uh, very fast, very explosive, just harsh noise, mm -hmm. um, which is something I haven't done in a while, uh, not with commuter so much. So that CDR came out and it was just like a self-release. I just handed it out to friends at Summer Scum. I saw a lot of people I just no have known for years and have wanted to meet for years and just all the homies mm -hmm. were there from the East Coast. So I made like, 30 copies of that, I think, and just handed it out. And obviously, like, a lot of people didn't get the chance to check it out because it was never really online or anything. Um, so Sam came to me, and he's like, uh, I'm starting World Asylum. I want to do mostly just, like, the people closest to me. Mm -hmm. I respect their music and, like, uh, want to give it a platform. So mm -hmm. he is releasing three tapes in the first World Asylum batch. It's going to be a Terror Cell Unit tape, Crawl of Time tape, and then that commuter album, uh, the album is called um, Ample Fire Strike Rising. Um, mm -hmm. So that is going to be re released as you know, an actual tape. Um, it's getting all the real treatment of an actual release, not just a CDR. So it's that, and then like a little bit of bonus material for it. So that is the next, those are the two things that are coming up right now that should be out. The cool. yeah, new forces full length, and then this other kind of re-release of of just this smaller, shorter tape of just ferocious, straight harsh noise. Um, so yeah, check that out. Uh, he'll be announcing it and making a site for it. But yeah, World Asylum. It's going to be called first three tapes: Terror Cell Unit, Crawl of Time, and, and the Commuter Tape. So that's pretty exciting as well. well that sounds great. That's very exciting. Yeah. I've seen I've seen whisperings of that. But that's yeah. Good to hear that that's really coming along now. That's mm -hmm. great. Totally. Cool. Well, Jackson, I really appreciate you taking the time and Absolutely. opening up and sharing what you do. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, this podcast has been a real joy to watch, kind of develop. Um, so I'm super honored that you've had me on here. So, you know, best sure. wishes to you in the, in the future of your podcast and also uh, to your life. You, the, you know, the announcement of your uh, pregnancy with your wife is awesome. So congratulations to you. Thank and, you. Yeah. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, take care and we'll talk soon. All right, Oscar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Head over to the Patreon now to hear Jackson talk in depth about working with his closest collaborators. He also shouts out a bunch of his favorite recent artists and releases and tells me his top five noise releases of all time. If you're watching this live, in just a few minutes, there'll be a post on Patreon visible to all Maniac Circle supporters. Be the first of seven people to comment on the post, and you'll win a free copy of the very limited commuter disc, Strike Rising Amplifier, which was only available privately at the Summer Scum Festival 2022. If you didn't catch that giveaway, don't worry, because New Forces has graciously donated a bunch of download codes of the new commuter album, No Longer Pentinent, which are also available to the Maniac Circle while supplies last. Go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to redeem your gifts and check out the exclusive noise content available there. I want to thank everyone who makes this podcast possible by supporting it through Patreon, everyone active on the Maniac Circle Discord, and especially the heavy sponsors of the podcast. Logan Chelmo, Joshua Peer, Casper Sonnet, Christoph Ruschak, John Ingram, Dries Bernard, Shane Taylor, DF, Lars Kenzie, and Eric Nystrand. You guys are the best. I really appreciate your support.